ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد today inshallah ta'ala we will embark on a new series of lectures a series of lectures concentrating on the life and times of the single greatest human being who has ever lived ever walked on the face of this earth and in today's lecture i wanted to begin by talking about some of the broad characteristics of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam some of the what in arabic is called shama'il some of the unique and specific characteristics that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam before we embark on the journey of sira and why we study sira and what is sira that will be inshallah next weekend next week and then we begin with the the birth and the pre-islamic arabia all of this will come before we even begin a little bit of a tantalizing tidbit if you like of the characteristics of the unique specialities that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was blessed with because when we begin these series by talking about his specialities even though all of us are motivated to study his sira when we study his specialities we will be even more motivated and we'll be even more eager to learn about the life and times the lessons and morals the incidents that occurred in the life of our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so where then do we begin when it comes to describing the one whom Allah has chosen above the entire creation how can we do justice to him when Allah azza wa jal himself says wa rafa'na laka dhikrak Allah says we have raised up your mentioning and remembrance Allah has raised up his mentioning and re- and remembrance and Ibn Abbas and other scholars of the Sahaba they said Allah has raised up his remembrance such that whenever Allah is mentioned the prophet sallam is mentioned right after that and how true this is whenever Allah is mentioned the prophet sallam is almost always mentioned right after that even in our shahada la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah in the adhan in the salah that we pray in the quran itself there's hardly a khutbah that we give except that we praise allah and we send salat and salam upon the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has called our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a rahmatan lil alamin you are the mercy to the entire world you are the embodiment of rahma allah has sent you and through you you will be given rahma and you are a rahma and you are the channel of allah's rahma so he is rahma of the prophet sallam is rahma and his sending is rahma and his message is rahma and his teachings is rahma and believing and acting upon what he has come with is a rahma he is everything associated with mercy that is rahmatan lil alamin so how then can we begin to do justice to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when allah has praised him so highly however even if we cannot mention all of those blessings and characteristics then at least let us mention some so that they can be an indication for that which is not uh, it cannot be mentioned because of time and restrictions and we began by mentioning some of the names that allah azza wa jal gave our prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for our prophet sallam had many names many of the names of our prophet sallam were given to him by later people the sahaba tabi'un the early scholars and one of the famous scholars of the sira has derived over 250 names of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if we were to give a class on this we'd spend 3 4 weeks just talking about that list but i wanted to mention some of the names that allah has given him because you see names come from allah and names come from the people 
And we are obviously the ones that come from the people, we can benefit from them. But the ones that Allah has given our Prophet ﷺ, those are the primary names that have the deepest meaning. And of the ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, his names, he said, عن جبير بن مطعم رضي الله تعالى إن صحيح مسلم The Prophet ﷺ said, إن لي أسماء I have a number of names. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling us he has a number of names. He said, أنا محمد I am Muhammad. Wa ana Ahmad. And I am Ahmad. I'm going to mention each of these names. Wa ana al Mahi. And I am al Mahi. Of his names is al Mahi. And he explained al Mahi is the one whom yamhu Allah bihi al Kufr. Allah erases Kufr. Wa ana al Hashir. Of his names is al Hashir. Al Ladi yahshur al Nasu ala qadami. People will be resurrected. Hashara yahshur means to be resurrected. On my footsteps, or meaning after me. وَأَنَا aqib Of his names is Aqib. And he said, Al-Aqib is the one who has no prophet after me. وَأَنَا نَبِيُّ rahma He said, I am the Nabiyu rahma That is one of my names, Nabiyu rahma وَأَنَا نَبِيُّ tawbah And I am the Nabi of repentance. وَأَنَا muqaffa And he is the muqaffa And... The Qaffa, we're going to dis- explain what this means, but the one that who has uh, come after all, or the one who pre- not, not predates, the one who comes consequently, the one who comes at the end of a long chain, that is Al-Muqaffa. وَأَنَا نَبِيُّ الْمَلَاحِمْ And I am the Prophet of Malahim. We're going to explain all of these names one by one. So, the most common names of the Prophet and the two that the Qur'an explicitly mentions, the Qur'an mentions many adjectives, but it only mentions two nouns. The Qur'an mentions many adjectives for the Prophet ﷺ. From those adjectives, we can derive names. So, Nabiyu Rahma, we can derive it from the Qur'an. Rahmatan lil alameen. This is a description, an adjective. But in terms of proper nouns, or in terms of nouns, there are two names that are mentioned. And these names are Muhammad and Ahmad. The name Muhammad is mentioned four times in the Qur'an. And the name Ahmed is mentioned a few times as well. If my memory serves me correctly, it is two or three times. The name Ahmed is mentioned. And every time it is mentioned, it is mentioned from the tongue of Jesus Christ. The only time Ahmed is mentioned is from the tongue of Jesus Christ. Nabi min ba'd ismuhu Ahmed. Isa ibn Maryam says that I'm going to tell you of a prophet coming after me. His name is Ahmed. Both Muhammad and Ahmed come from Hamida, Yahmadu Hamdan. And ham, uh, to, Hamd means to praise. But not any type of praise. Hamd is what the first word of the Quran, Alhamdulillah. And Hamd means to praise not in return for some favor given to you, because that is shukr. If somebody does you something, you praise them back, that is shukr. You, you, that's, that, that is a praise. Bimuqabil, it's something that you give and take, right? You give me some money, I say thank you. Or you're a generous man. This is not called hamd. This is shukr. Because you have given something back in return for something he's given you. Hamd is higher than shukr. Shukr is a transaction in a way, even though it is something that is good. Higher than shukr is hamd. And hamd is the highest form of praise. Hamd is a praise that is given because of the inherent characteristics in the object that you're praising. Not because he's done you anything, you give him back to him. Because he deserves to be praised for who he is. Hamd is an object of perfection, an object that is worthy of being praised. uh, praised. Regardless of what he's done or hasn't done, he is worthy of being shown praise. And so, the Prophet ﷺ has two names, and his two most common names come from the root which describes praise. Why? Because Allah has praised him. And the angels have praised him. And the people on earth have praised him. And all the prophets have praised him. And every single one of mankind praises him directly or indirectly. As for praising him directly, these are the Muslims. They praise him directly. And as for praising him indirectly, then the characteristics and qualities that he has come with are characteristics and qualities of perfection. So even those who reject him by the tongue, they must 
admit and they must praise the qualities that he came with. Mercy, tenderness, rahmah, shafaq. It doesn't matter even if their tongues deny his prophethood, they must praise the qualities that are in him. So he is worthy of praise from all of humanity. And therefore, the Prophet ﷺ is praised in the heavens and in the earth. He is praised in, in the previous umam and in the present umam. He is praised in this dunya and in the akhirah. This is the ultimate praise. There is no human being who has ever been praised or is praised at this point in time or who shall continue to be praised more than our Prophet wasallam. And think about it. No millisecond occurs on this earth except that there are not millions, not tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people around the globe praising this one person sallallahu alaihi wasallam either by sending durood and salat and salam or by giving a khutbah or lecture or by giving uh, 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 the uh, saying the salah because you cannot pray any salah you cannot pray any rak'ah except that what do you do in that rak'ah allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad think about it there is no second on earth that goes by except that hundreds of millions of people are praising this one human being there is no no person who is more praised than our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the ultimate praise that he will be given by humanity. Of course, the ultimate praise he is given is by Allah. As for humanity, the ultimate praise he will be given will be the praise that he will be given on Yawm al Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment. On that day. All kafirs will know the truth of Islam. You cannot deny Allah when you are seeing Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Muslim and non-Muslim, they will know the truth. Of course, it is too late to believe in the truth, but they will know it. So when they recognize the truth, the people will all go to Adam alayhi salam. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. They will all go to Adam alayhi salam. And they will say, O oh Adam, you are our father. And Allah created you with his hands. And Allah blew his ruh into you. Do you not see the situation your children are in? Why don't you go to Allah and beg for forgiveness? Why don't you go to Allah and beg Him to start the reckoning so that we can move on? So Adam alayhi salam will make an excuse and he will say, I committed a sin that I should not have done, meaning I'm not worthy to go and ask Allah Azza wa Jal, I committed a sin and I'm worried about myself. Nafsi, nafsi, go to another person, go to Nuh alayhi salam. And so humanity at large, will go to the Prophet Nuh. And the same request. And the Prophet Nuh will say, I made a mistake which I should not have done. Allah told me not to ask anybody to be saved. And I asked him to save my son. And I disobeyed him. And I'm worried about myself. Nafsi, nafsi, go to somebody else. Go to Ibrahim. They will go to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam will say the same thing. That I made three lies. Even though they were not lies. But he's so worried. He says, I made three lies. And I'm worried about those lies on the day of judgment. What are these three lies? Number one, he said, the big idol did it. Right? This is da'wah, it's not even a lie. But he's so worried now. I don't know, maybe Allah will call me to task. Number two, he said, I'm sick. When his idol, when his uh, people went out of the town, he said, inni saqim, I'm sick, I don't want to go with you. So let, let me stay here. Why? Because he wanted to destroy the idols. Uh, and number three, he called uh, Sarah, his wife, uh, he said, Sarah is my sister, meaning in Islam, because the king was about to kill him. So he said, she's my sister, I'm not husband, wife, we are sister and brother. Meaning, and he meant sister in Islam, because he wanted to save his life. These three things he was so worried about, he said, I'm too scared, go to somebody else, go to uh, Musa alayhi salam. And Musa will also make an excuse, he will say, I kill somebody in anger, even though it was an accident, I kill somebody in anger, I'm worried, so go to somebody else, they will go to Isa. Isa alayhi salam will also uh, say, I'm not worthy, go to somebody else, and so all of mankind will come to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. All of mankind, Muslim and Kafir. And they will beg the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to intercede, to be a representative, to be a a messenger from them to Allah and to be an intercessor and to be a representative. So they choose one human being to be a representative, to go in front of Allah and plead for all of humanity. Plead what? 
to begin Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Because the Qiyamah is taking too long. And they are getting so worried. So, uh, so if you like, the punishment is increasing. Because Qiyamah itself is 50,000 years. فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ يَغْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً Qiyamah itself is a type of punishment. And the people who have rejected Allah, they will be so exasperated by Qiyamah, they will say, whatever comes, let it come. Let's just get rid of this day. Let's move on to whatever it is. The tension is too much. So they will beg Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to go in front of Allah and begin the, and ask Allah to begin the reckoning. And and so the Prophet ﷺ will say, this is my job. Ana laha, ana laha. This is my responsibility. And so he will then go in front of Allah. And because he will be the representative, all of humanity will praise him. And he will be given the praiseworthy station, which is called Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud. This is Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud. This is exactly what Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud is. What is Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud means? Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud means the station, Maqam, the rank. That is Mahmud. What is Mahmud from Hamd? It is for the one that is praised. Everyone will praise him. No human being will be left except that he will thank the Prophet ﷺ and be thankful to him and praise him for the Maqam al-Mahmud. Allah will lift him up to the Maqam al-Mahmud. The angels will praise him. Humanity will praise him. Every single being in existence will praise the Prophet ﷺ at that point in time. It is Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud. And because it is Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud, who better to than it be given to than the one who is Muhammad and the one who is Ahmad. Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud is for Muhammad and it is for Ahmad. What, and both of them mean the one who is ultimately praised. What is the difference between Muhammad and Ahmad? Muhammad, for those of you learning Arabic, is Mufa'al, uh, and Hamada Yuhammidu Tahmid, and Muhammad means that he is being given uh, continuous praise, continuously, time after time, praise after praise. So Muhammad is for the quantity of praise. That every single point in time he is being praised. And as we already said, from the beginning of time, up until our time, till the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, after the day of judgment, all of the time our Prophet will be praised. So Muhammad is for continuity. Muhammad is for quantity. And as for Ahmad, ala wazni af'al, Ahmad means that he is being given the best type of praise, the highest quality of praise. So Ahmad is for quality, Muhammad is for quantity, and the both are combined in our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that he is worthy of being the, the praise the highest way that any human being can be praised. Of course, the praise that we give to Allah is a different type of praise, and that is a divine praise. But the highest praise for any human being is for our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the most continuous praise is for our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Muhammad is for quantity, Ahmad is for quality, and the both of them are combined in our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who will be given al-maqam al-mahmud, which is the praiseworthy station. Now, as for the issue of why is it that the Prophet Musa alayhi salam predicted our Rasul with the name of Muhammad, as the Quran says, and Isa predicted our Rasul with the name of Ahmad, the famous scholar Ibn al-Qayyim said that the wisdom behind this the wisdom behind this is that the largest ummah after our ummah is that of the Jews, the Bani Israel. They are the largest ummah of real followers. That is because the Christians, as we believe, the majority of them, they took a different path. That of Paul and his version of Christianity. The original Christians, the true believers of Isa, were few in number. And their religion died out very quickly. Uh, as you know, Constantine and all of these, they changed the religion. And it became a trinity, it became a d divine nature of Jesus Christ. Of course, Isa never preached this from our perspective. So, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, his people were the largest ummah of true Muslims after our ummah. And therefore they were given quantity because they have quantity. 
So they are told the name that is conducive, that is fitting with them because they're a large quantity. As for the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, his followers were few, his disciples were few, and the people who truly followed the actual message of Jesus Christ were not that many, but they were great in quality. The disciples and those who followed them, they were persecuted, they were tortured, the pagan Romans killed them, they put them in front of the lions, they combed their, 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 their uh, bones and their flesh with combs of iron. Just like you see on the movies, these tortures, this was given to the early Christians, the real Christians, meaning the followers of Jesus Christ, the true followers of Isa ibn Maryam. They were few in number, but they were truly devoted and righteous. And so for them, they were given the name Ahmed, because they were people of quality. They were people of quality, and they were told that our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam would be the one who is worthy of the best quality of praise. And so Muhammad and Ahmad are both his names. Of the third name that he mentions, an Al-Mahi. Al-Mahi, he explained it himself. Al-Mahi is the one whom Allah yamhu Allahu bihi al-kufr. And Maha means to efface, to wipe out. Maha means to wipe out. So through me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe out. Kufr. And we see this occurring in his lifetime, that the Arabian Peninsula was immersed in Kufr. And in his own lifetime, the, the, the entire peninsula was immersed in Islam. And within 20-30 years, major bastions of Kufr were then converted to Islam and they have been in Islam ever since. Within 60-70 years, Islam reached the borders of China and Andalus where it remains to this day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used our Prophet as Al-Mahi. Al-Mahi means to wipe away. And wallah, if you look at a geographic map, if you look at a historical geographic map that tells you the expansion of Islam, you see exactly what Al-Mahi is. Literally, the religion of Islam is expanding 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. It's as if the other kufr is being wiped away and the religion of Islam is spreading forth. All of this is Al-Mahi, the one who erases and effaces kufr. وَأَنَ hashir the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Hashir, he explained it as well. الَّذِي يَحْشُرُ النَّاسُ عَلَىٰ قَدَمِي That mankind will be resurrected عَلَىٰ قَدَمِي عَلَىٰ قَدَمِي means two things. Means at my feet literally, but what it actually means is right after me. So the Prophet ﷺ is the signal, signaling of the Day of Judgment. And in fact, the coming of the Prophet ﷺ is the first sign of the Day of Judgment. His sending is the first sign that judgment is now close. Compared to all the previous prophets, the very bi'tha, the very risala of our Prophet ﷺ is the first of the signs of the day of judgment. So he is saying, Anal hashir. Another interpretation is that I am the first person who will be resurrected and everybody will be resurrected after me. So after I am resurrected, I will be the first person resurrected and even the order of resurrecting shall be a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no question that the prophets will be resurrected first and foremost and then the salihun and the uh, shuhada and then the rest of the ummah. So even the order of resurrection and the order of Recognizing what's happening, because Allah mentions in the Quran that when they uh, are resurrected, they'll be shaking off the dust and they will say, Ya waylana man ba'athana min man qardina. What is happening to us? Who has brought us forth from our resting places? People will be confused what's happening. And the prophets will understand immediately what is happening. And the first person to be resurrected and the first person to understand will be our Prophet. So he's saying, An al hashir. The one that is signaling the hashr. By his coming, he is signaling the coming of the Day of Judgment. And by his resurrection on the Day of Judgment, he will be the one after whom everybody else will be resurrected. وَأَنَ aqib And he said, I am the aqib. Al aqib, he himself explained it. There is no prophet after me. لَيْسَ بَعْدِي nabi. So al aqib means the successor. The the uh, the word seal is not appropriate because that's khatim. But uh, what it means is that the one who cuts off, basically, uh, the one who is at the end, is the best phrase here. Al aqib, the one who comes at the end. And then he said, "I am the Nabi Rahma, and I am the Nabi Tawbah." And you understand Nabi Rahma, and Allah calls him Rahmatan lil Alamin. I am the Nabi Tawbah, which means I am the Prophet that is the Prophet of repentance. 
I am the source of repentance, meaning that by believing in me, and by following my teachings, people can be forgiven. And I am Al-Muqaffa, Al-Muqaffa here means that the one who comes at the end and makes the previous prophets complete. Or the one who makes the message of the previous prophets, there's no need anymore because we have the full message or the complete message of the Prophet wasallam. And in one hadith he called himself, أَنَا نَبِيُّ الْمَلَاحِمْ I am the Prophet that will signal lots of trials. And that is because the biggest trials that the world has ever seen will occur with the Ummah and during the Ummah of the Prophet wasallam. Trials such as the Dajjal and trials such as the three major earthquakes that will signal the end of time and trials such as the coming down of Isa ibn Maryam and the Mahdi all of these major trials they will occur within the Ummah of this Prophet Wasallam. so he called himself I am Nabiul Malahim and this is uh, 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 a description that is more of a warning for us and for those who oppose him that, the, that there's going to be a lot of trials and tribulations in his time and there are other names that are mentioned in the Sunnah and there are other descriptions mentioned in the Quran and inshallah in the course of our lectures and series we will be uh, talking about some of them as for his specialities what is called in Arabic khasais something that only he was given and no other human being was given and there are many books written by the early scholars about khasais nabi and about shama'il nabi which means that his characteristics and what is unique to him and there are many many uh, characteristics that are unique to him some scholars in our times have lifted has listed listed up to 50 specific and unique characteristics and blessings that only he was given and no other human being was given. Some of these, again, this is all a summary, there's so much more that can be said. Some of these, number one, he is the final prophet of Allah. No prophet of Allah has obviously ever been the final prophet. And there's only one prophet that can be the final. And Allah chose him to be the final prophet. And this is explicitly mentioned in the Quran. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ And in another recitation, وَخَاتِمَ النَّبِيِّينَ And that is the seal and the end of the prophets. Number two. The prophethood of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had been decreed by Allah even before Adam alaihi salam existed. Even before Adam alaihi salam was a living soul, Allah had decreed the prophet, the prophethood of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam even before the ruh was blown into Adam. One of the Sahaba asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When were you decreed to be a prophet, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when Adam was between the teen, between the mud and the ruh. In other words, Adam was not yet combined with ruh and teen. When Adam Alayhi Salam was still two separate entities, and that is the ruh and the teen. When before the ruh was blown in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already destined and decreed that I would be coming for mankind. Of the specialities of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi number three, is that he is the only Prophet to have been sent for all of humanity. In fact, the only Prophet to have been sent even to the jinn. No prophet before our Prophet ﷺ was sent to all of humanity. No prophet. Every single prophet was sent to a specific nation. Now, somebody can say here, Adam salam was a prophet and he was sent to all of the people of his time because his children, there were only his children there. And Nuh salam was a Rasul. And he was sent to the people of his time, and there was no other people of his time, so he too was sent to the people of all of humanity. How then can this be a unique thing for our Prophet ﷺ? The response is that Adam and Nuh were both exceptions that simply happened by a coincidence of early history, in that Adam is the first human, and the only human beings will be his descendants. It is not that Allah destined him with the title, you have been sent to humanity. It just so happens that the only humanity are his children. And the same goes for the first messenger ever sent, and that is Nuh There's only one city 
in all of humanity. There's only one city. Nuh alayhi salam, when he was sent, there weren't villages and qariyas all over the place. There's just one group, one people, one nation, one community. That's his people. And so when Allah wipes that one village out, the world is wiped out because that's the only one village out there. So once again, it is not as if Nuh was intended to be sent for all of humanity. It just so happened that all of humanity was one village. And that's why both of these are the earliest two prophets, right? No prophet after them when there were multiple cities was sent to both cities. No prophet after them when there were other civilizations was sent to more than two civilizations other than our Prophet ﷺ. He wasn't just sent to two civilizations. He was sent to all of humanity and not just this, another speciality, he was actually even sent to the jinn. And this is a uniqueness that no other prophet has ever been sent for. And inshallah, in the course of our lectures, we will mention a very famous incident in the early Meccan seerah. It is called the night of the jinn. The night of the jinn. And on this night, the jinns came to Mecca, Muslim jinns, and they wanted the Prophet to teach them about Islam. So the Prophet went and he taught them what they needed to know. And there are details that we know of that night, and we'll talk about it during that time. Of the specialities of our Prophet ﷺ, that no other nation and no other Prophet has been given, our Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has helped me with ru'ub. Ru'ub means a type of fear that Allah will inflict into my enemies even before I reach them. Even one month's journey before I come to them, they will become terrified of me. So Allah helped him without even physical combat. That in his time, of course this is unique to him only, not to the rest of prophets or even to his ummah, to him only. That when he went into battle against an enemy, then the people began became terrified of him even before he reached them. And this he said, Allah help me with ru'ub. And ru'ub is frightening or fear. Uh, and Allah stru- stru- struck fear into the hearts of my enemies for the distance of one entire month. Of the specialities that he has been given was that he has been given the largest ummah out of all of the prophets. And this is mentioned in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari that he said that Allah showed me the ummahs and I saw an ummah as large as the eye could see. And I said, maybe this is my ummah. And I was told, no, this is the ummah of Musa alayhi salam. And then I saw an ummah even larger than that. And then I was told, and it was larger than the horizon. It blocked my vision. And I was told, this is your ummah. And in another hadith, he said that to the Sahaba, do you wish that your ummah, meaning the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, should be one third of the people of Jannah? They said, Allahu Akbar. There have been hundreds and thousands of ummahs. And if one ummah is one third of Jannah, Allahu Akbar. So he was silent. Then he said, would you be happy if I told you that your ummah is one half of the people of Jannah? They said, Allahu Akbar. Then he was silent. And then he said, By Allah, my hope is that my ummah shall be two-thirds of the people of Jannah. Not that we want to kick the other ummahs out. Astaghfirullah, they're all going to get in if they deserve it. But that our ummah will be so large. And subhanAllah, modern estimates say, how many people are Muslim on the face of this earth? Around one billion, right? One billion. Do the math from the time of the Prophet ﷺ until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Imagine... I mean, already the percentages are so huge. And then compare them to the real followers of the prophets, right? The actual true Christians, not the Christians who believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. The Christians who believed in Jesus Christ as being Rasulullah. How few must they be? And then the actual Bani Israel at the time of Musa, at the time of the prophets of the old who believed in the prophets, they must have been in the hundreds of millions. Great number, mashallah, great number. But you cannot compare to the billion that we have now and, and, and throughout history for 14 centuries and Allah knows how many centuries till Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And so when you look at that, inshallah you can see how true the Prophet And imagine he's speaking at a time when there's only one city of Muslims, that's Medina. He's speaking at a time when there are maybe 1500 Muslims Muslims on earth, and there are probably two, three million Christians and hundreds and thousands of Jews. And he's telling a group of 50 Sahaba in his masjid that I hope that inshallah you will be two thirds of the people of Jannah. When we hear this hadith now, we say, of course, it's common sense. But when he said it, it was a miracle. And we see this now, Ra'yal Ain, with our two eyes. Of his specialities, 
that no other prophet has been given, is that he has been given the most powerful miracle. And that is the miracle of the Qur'an. Now, I've given many lectures about this issue, and inshallah one day we'll talk also about this issue in more detail. But there is no miracle that compares to the Qur'an. There is no miracle that compares to the Qur'an. And one thing will demonstrate this for you, and that is that, look, look at any other miracle that you can imagine. The splitting of the Red Sea, or the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus Christ resurrected by the permission of Allah, the dead. Right? All of these miracles, we have no access to them. We didn't see the splitting of the Red Sea. You weren't there when Jesus Christ called out to Lazarus and he came out walking from the grave. So how do we... It's not really a miracle for me and you except that we believe in it. But the Qur'an is a miracle that I can hand to a non-Muslim. Say, here, this is the miracle of my Prophet. The Qur'an is a miracle I can recite and the people can hear. It's a living miracle. It's a miracle that all of humanity has access to. And there is no miracle that compares to the miracle of the Qur'an in many different ways. And that is the topic of an entire other lecture. Of the specialities that our Prophet ﷺ has been given. And no other Prophet has been given. And we will spend inshaAllah two or three weeks discussing this one speciality. Is the night journey of al Isra wal Mi'raj. No other Prophet has had the privilege of undertaking this journey. Even when Allah Azza wa Jal spoke with one of the greatest prophets, and that is Musa alayhi salam, it was the divine speech that was given to Musa while Musa was on earth. Musa was on Turi Sayna, and Allah spoke with him. As for our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the only human being to have been called up to the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal. No other human being has ever been called up to the presence of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ undertook a journey that no other makhluk as far as we know ever undertook. And he went up to a maqam that Jibreel told him, my permission stops here, you must go alone. Even Jibreel said, I, this is my my, my stop is right, my visa, whatever you want to call it, right? This is where it ends. ends. I can't go any further. And so our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam went up, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ يَأْوَدْنَا According to an interpretation. And this we'll talk about inshallah in more detail uh, uh, the, in, in the journey of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. But this is definitely one of the greatest blessings that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was given. Of his specialities that he was given is that he is the leader of all of humanity. And he himself told us this in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adama. I am the Sayyid. The Sayyid here means Sayyid, Sada Yasudu means the one who is in charge of, the one who is the representative, the one who is the leader. Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adam. I am the Sayyid. Of the children of Adam. And what does Sayyid here means? Many meanings. First and foremost, he is the master meaning. What does it mean Sayyid master here? Meaning he is the perfection of humanity. And he deserves to be the leader of humanity. And he will be the leader of humanity on the day of judgment. So the Sayyid here has multiple meanings. And he is all of these meanings. So the Prophet ﷺ is the Sayyid of the Day of Judgment. Of the blessings that are unique to him, is that the Prophet ﷺ will be the very first human being to be resurrected on the Day of Judgment as we said. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari tells us this. The first grave to open up when the second trumpet is blown, there are two trumpets, right? ثُمَّ نُفِقَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى The trumpet will be blown twice. The second trumpet will be when the graves will be opening up. So when the graves are opening up, the Prophet ﷺ said, the first grave that will crack open will be mine. The Prophet ﷺ will be the first human being, and that also explains his name, Al-Hashir. And he will also be the first human being to be clothed on the day of judgment. Of the specialities that he has been given, is that he will be given the largest hawd. And hawd is a pool that our Prophet ﷺ has been promised. We talked about this when we talked about tafsir of Surah Al-Kawthar. And this is a pool, a hawd, which is square in shape. He has told us it is square in shape. And it is so large that one side of it, one of these squares, it is as if it is from Mecca to Sana'a. 
which is the entire Arabia, or half of the Arabian Peninsula, right? From Mecca to Sana'a, this is just one side of it. You multiply that by four, you get the perimeter. And I described the Kawthar and the Hawd in a previous lecture, inshaAllah ta'ala, you can go back to that. Of his speciality is the Kawthar. He has been given the main tributary, the main river of Jannah. And all the rivers of Jannah split from that. It is as if, one can say, it is as if the people of Jannah will drink water from the gift of the Prophet ﷺ. Because it is Al-Kawthar. And Al-Kawthar is, Inna أَعْطَيْنَا Al-Kawthar. So the people of Jannah's water is all a gift for, and coming from, and given to our Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Of his specialities is, he will be the first to cross over the Sirat. And he will be the one guiding his Ummah to Jannah. And he will be the first to knock on the doors of Jannah. And he will be the first human being to ever enter Jannah after our father Adam has left it. And he will be the one in whose name the gates of Jannah will be opened when he knocks on the door. And the angel, uh, the Bab, the, 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 the angel in charge of the gate will say, Who is it? And he will say, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The angel will say, To you, I have been commanded to open. Meaning I can't open for anybody else. You are the one I have to open for. And so when his name is uttered, it is his name that will give me the permission to open up the gates of Jannah. And therefore, as he told us, the very first footstep to be entering into Jannah will be that, the right foot of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then his ummah will be the first ummah, even though we are the last ummah chronologically. But because we are his ummah, Ummah. And because we are His followers, Allah will bless us, and Allah will gift us, and Allah will honor us, not because of us, but because of Him. And we will be asked to enter along with Him. So we will be the first Ummah to enter Jannah, even though we are the last Ummah chronologically. And this is of His specialities. And the final speciality we'll mention, and there is so much more to be said, uh, but time is of the essence here. The final speciality that will be mentioned is that Allah has blessed him with the highest level of Jannah. It is a level that is the pinnacle of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. It is an entire level. Some scholars have said that Jannah, you can look at it kind of like a pyramid, in that the higher up you go, the fewer the people. Right? The higher up you go, the fewer the people. So Jannah will be more populated at the lower levels. And there will be no crowding in Jannah, alhamdulillah. But nonetheless, it will be more populated in the lower levels. And the higher up you go, fewer and fewer people will be able to get to those levels. And there will come a point and there will come a level that is an entire level of Jannah. And that is meant for only one person. The whole darajah. The whole plane of that field of Jannah is only meant for one person. And it is the pinnacle of Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. And it is immediately underneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is called Al-Fadila. This is called Al-Fadila. This daraja is called Al-Fadila. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this Fadila is a manzila fil jannah. It is a level of jannah that Allah has chosen for only one of His servants. For only one of His servants. And then He said modestly that, فَأَرْجُو I hope that an akuna anahu that I am that person. And this is out of His modesty. illa there is no other human being that is qualified to be of that place. And so He simply said, I hope I pray that I am the person that that is destined for. And that is why he wanted us to pray that Allah gives him this wasila and fadila. And that is why every time the adhan is called, what do we say? Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma wa salati al-qa'ima. Aati Muhammadan al-wasila wal-fadila. That is the daraja of Jannah. Right? Wabaathhu. So ati is for the yom al ati is for the day of judgment. Ati is for after the day of judgment. You give him after the day of judgment, we give him al wasila wal fadila. That is al wasila wal fadila. Wa and resurrect him 
on the day of judgment, maqam al-mahmud alladhi wa'atta. So the maqam al-mahmud is on the day of judgment. We explain what that is. And that is, all of humanity will be praising him. And all of humanity will be sending their salat and salam upon him. Even those who rejected him in this world. Even those who cursed him and ridiculed him and mocked him and drew diagrams against him. Wallahi, on that day, they will be praising him and sending salawat and salam upon him. Because they have to, because it is maqam al-mahmud. So all of humanity will be praising him on the day of judgment, on maqam al-mahmud. And in the akhirah, he will be given al-wasila and al-fadila. And that is why we make dua to Allah to give him all of these levels and characteristics. And these are simply some of the khasa'is, some of the specialities of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And unfortunately, there's only a few minutes left, so there's no point beginning the next section, which is about his characteristics and how he looked and his mannerisms and his lifestyle. Insha'Allah ta'ala, we will be talking about that uh, next uh, Wednesday, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala.